Welcome to another ML Boost episode. By the end of this video, we will see how split conformal methods can be implemented using NumPy only in just a few lines of code. The reason I have chosen to go with a NumPy only approach as opposed to using conformal libraries is because, as I'm sure you agree, it's the most effective way to gain a solid understanding of this powerful tool's inner workings. But before we get into the needy greedy details, let's take a quick trip down memory lane. We started this playlist on uncertainty quantification by discussing why UQ is essential and what makes a good UQ method. We then laid the foundation of full conformal methods and showed how split conformal methods emerge as a solution to the computational challenges of their full counterparts. In our last episode, we took a deeper dive into split conformal methods. Deriving the equation for the predicted interval that makes it remarkably straightforward to implement. Today, we will put that knowledge to practical use. While this equation may seem daunting at first, as we will soon see, it's much simpler than it may appear. Let's get started. Let's imagine the simplest possible setting that allows us to get to the main point of this episode, which is again, not only being able to implement split conformal methods from scratch, but fully understanding what is going on. Imagine we are given a pre-trained model that makes point predictions. This means we don't need to worry about training. Our task is to convert this point predictor into a reliable interval predictor. Reliable means intervals that have coverage guarantees. For example, when we present a 90% prediction interval, the probability of the true unknown label being within the interval should be at least 90%, if not more. In addition to the pre-trained model, we are also given a set of labeled points that were not used for training. So we want to build a tool that inputs a pre-trained point predictor, set of data points not used for training, and outputs a reliable interval predictor. What allows us to build this tool is the equation we developed in the last episode. This equation, again, may appear intimidating at first, but soon we will break it into pieces to realize that it's in fact a very simple one to use. First, we have Y hat point predictions coming from the pre-trained model, the yellow curve. Next, we have S, the non-conformity measuring function. It's a function of the error that the point predictor makes for a given point. In its simplest form, it can be the absolute error between the point prediction y hat and the true label y. Then we have the superscript minus one, which shows we are talking about the inverse of the s function. When s is the absolute error function, its inverse will be equal to the input of the function itself. So we can simplify the equation by simply eliminating s minus one. Again, this is something we can do only when our non-conformity measuring function s is equal to the absolute errors and not otherwise. Now we get to the part of the equation that perhaps requires a little more effort for understanding Q and its subscript. We have discussed where this term is coming from around minute 16 of episode number 4 of this playlist. Here, we want to understand it in the context of our current example, where we have four points 
for which we have the labels, but they were not used in training the model, the brown dots. Let's call them calibration points. Pass each of these points the non-conformity measuring function S to get the set of non-conformity values. The set will contain the values of 0 0.26, 0 0.31, 0 0.54, 0.81 sorted from low to high. We discussed in the previous episode that because of exchangeability, these non-conformity values are all valid quantiles, and the job of the subscrape, the ceiling of n plus 1 times delta divided by n, is to pick a specific quantile depending on the values of n and delta. Let's discuss how the selection of the right quantile through the subscript takes place through an example. Our n is 4. Imagine the desired confidence level delta is 0.2. This will make the ceiling of n plus 1 times delta equal to 1, which means that the q that we have in the equation will be q subscript 1 slash 4, or the first out of 4 available quantiles, or 0.26. So, to get the 20% interval, you simply need to add and subtract 0.26 from y hat. You can, of course, repeat the exact same process for other values of the confidence level delta. So, I hope that with the discussion that we just had, I was able to convince you that the equation we started with, despite its perhaps intimidating appearance, is not like that at all. Let's do a quick recap. We are given a pre-trained model and a set of label points that were not used for training. We want to convert that point predictor into a reliable interval predictor using an equation that we derived in the previous episode. We also discussed that unlike its complex look, the equation is in fact a very simple one. All it does is to pick the appropriate non-conformity quantile using the subscript, then passes that to the inverse of the non-conformity measuring function, and then adds and subtracts the result from the point predictor y hat. Here is a question that is worth thinking about. The process of simplifying the equation we discussed was for the when s is equal to the absolute error. What will the process be when s is equal to the squared errors? So, now that we have dived deep into the world of split conformal methods and understood what these methods do, it's time to put our knowledge into action. In the upcoming segment, we will go through a Python code to see how to implement split conformal methods using NumPy only and test it on the Boston Housing dataset. You can find the notebook for this on the channel's GitHub page. Link in the descriptions section of the video. The Boston Housing dataset has about 500 data points. Let's say we use 200 of those points for calibration and only 20 for validation. The rest is reserved for training. The reason I have used such a low number of validation points is to keep the graphics that I'm about to show less congested. Let's kick things off by constructing a point predictor and looking into its results. Now, about this plot. On the horizontal axis, we have the actuals, and on the vertical one, the predictions. The diagonal line represents y equal to x and serves as a reference. Predictions that are close to the line have lower error than those which are away from it. Now, remember the conformal tool we wanted to build? 
let's implement it within a single class called conformalizer. This conformalizer class takes as input a pre-trained model, calibration and data, and a desired confidence level delta. It provides a dot predict method, but not only returns point predictions, but also upper and lower bonds of the prediction interval. Essentially, what this method does is add and subtract a specific quantile, typically referred to as Q hat, from the Y hat values, just as we discussed earlier. You might wonder how is that quantile calculated? It's a crucial step. We start by making point predictions on the calibration set, then calculate their non-conformities. Finally, use the numpy.quantile function to determine the desired quantile value q hat. Now that we have this class in place, using it is remarkably straightforward. To obtain an interval predictor, which we can call the conformalized model, all we need to do is pass the pre-trained point predictor as input. Once that's done, calling the dot predict method on this conformalized model becomes our gateway to obtaining not only point predictions, but also the associated upper and lower bounds of the prediction interval. With a confidence level delta of 0.9, our predicted intervals will be like this. With this visualization, a predicted interval covers the actual value when it intersects with the diagonal line y equal to x. Looking at the plot, you will notice that this happens for 16 out of the 20 validation points, accounting for 80% of them. Now, you might be wondering, wait a minute, our confidence level is set to 90%, so shouldn't we expect at least 90% of the validation points to fall within the predicted intervals? Why is it only 80%? This is a valid question and a very important one. It might seem like a contradiction to the claim of coverage validity in conformal methods or perhaps it raises concerns about my implementation. But none of these are the case. In the next episode, we will dive into this puzzle and see how to properly check coverage validity claims of conformal methods. Until then, thanks for watching and talk to you next time.